Hey everybody, my name is Darian Dozier and welcome to Melanated and Educated. Welcome to Melanated and Educated Interview Series. My name is Darian Dozier, and today I'm interviewing Dr. Milhouse. Dr. Milhouse, how are you today? I'm doing very well. Thank you. Yes, and thank you for joining us. We're super duper excited to have you. Um, I'm trying to get more consistent with these interviews, and so I'm so glad that I was able to reach out to you and you were able to make this work in your schedule. Yes, so you got me at a good time. I'm off this week. Usually I'm super busy, but this week I got time, so I'm excited to join you. Good. See, it all worked out. You're supposed to be here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, well, I'm just going to dive right in. So the first question I wanted to ask you is, where are you from? And can you give us a little information about your background? Sure. So I, that question where I'm from is like, I have to think about how I want to answer. I'm like, hmm, do I start from the beginning, beginning or like the, you know, the primary place? But um, anyway, not to give too much of a long-winded answer. I was born in Nigeria, so I am an originally um, Nigerian born and my parents immigrated with my brother and I when we were very little. Um, I was I think two years old and we uh, immigrated to the United States. Uh, lived a couple different places before we officially settled and I grew up primarily in Texas. Texas is what I consider my my first home is Nigeria but my home home is Texas. That's where I spent I grew up and spent all my formative years all the way up into through college medical school. It wasn't until residency that I um, left the state of Texas and am now been living in Chicago for the last, oh my gosh, I have to think about it, um, 13 years or something like that. Uh, okay. So uh, it's can't, it kind of seems like it's long by and then it also seems like it's taken, it's been a lifetime, but anyway. Um, and so home now is Chicago. Great. I was just there a couple of weeks ago and I absolutely loved it. Yeah. Um, if I didn't know how cold y'all's winters were. I would like, this is the best, best city ever. Yes. Anywhere. Yes. I know every summer it plays that mind trick on you. It's like, I love this place. This is the best place to be on earth. And then the summer exits and you deal with the rest of the winter for like six, seven, eight months. And you're every year, it's like, why do I live here? And then the summer comes back again. <laughs> you and forget. you're like, this is why. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I actually have a professor who's from Egypt and he said his first um, city that he ever lived in America was Chicago. So he said to come from Egypt to Chicago winter was like the biggest change for him. He didn't have a coat, anything. <laughs> That was actually when my parents left and immigrated, the first place that we landed, I was I was too young to remember this, but was Chicago. We actually lived in Chicago for probably about 18 months. Okay. Um, and that was our first place. So when I matched and did and was going to residency in Chicago, my parents were like, oh, you're going back to our first landing spot, you know? <laughs> um, so it was a little nostalgic for them. Again, I was too young to remember that. Period. Definitely seemed to work full circle, and, and now I'm based in, in Texas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This exactly. is this is my first time living in Texas, and it's yeah. been quite interesting. But um, I like it so far. Part of Texas. Um, I live in Houston. Okay, so Houston. I've lived in Houston, Austin, and Dallas. Okay, I have to say Austin's probably my favorite city. But now that they're growing, but their highways aren't growing, it's my yeah, least favorite. Oh my God, the highways in Austin are horrendous. <laughs> were horrendous when I lived there, and it was nothing like it is now. Um, they were horrendous then. So they are, you know, unfortunately a big infrastructure problem in Austin. Austin is a beautiful, very very unique city, growing mm -hmm. crazy. So so different to see Austin when I go now versus when I was, I went there for undergrad. Um, Houston was, is actually my favorite city um, that I lived in of the three places. Um, I really like Houston. Um, so yeah, I hope you learned to love it like I did. <laughs> yeah, it's just a big change for me. I'm from the Midwest. So coming down here was yeah. culture shock. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, awesome. Okay, well now I'm curious about what made you wanna be a doctor? Um, what is your medical specialty and how did you come to choose that? 
So any like any every good Nigerian or any good Nigerian immigrant um, or you know child of of, of immigrant parents, I kind of had three <laughs> professions that we were molded to kind of think that this was the only pathway, you know, uh, that, uh, not, I'm not saying that this is the right way of parenting, but this is the way that was parented. It was like, become a doctor, lawyer, engineer, and I just gravitated toward doctoring. Um, it, it seemed, it, it was, you know, it was a natural choice for me. I am, a, I'm a people person. I like people to be happy around me. I like to make people feel better. Um, and you know, helping people in whatever capacity um, I can is brings me joy. So that was easy. I didn't know at all what kind of doctor I wanted to be. I think when you're a kid, you just think doctor. You don't really think in, at least I didn't, I was simplistic. I was like, uh, you know, and I really didn't even start to think about what type of doctor until I got to medical school. Like I maybe toyed around with different things a little bit before. I mean, there was a period of time that I thought maybe I wanted to be a dentist. Maybe I wanted to be a psychologist, maybe, you know, but um, ended up going to medical, you know, the medical doctor route. And, and again, I didn't know what specialty I was. And I had no idea what a urologist was until I got to medical school. And when I found out what it was, um, I was like, oh, no, that's <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I didn't know that existed, and that doesn't really sound like something that I would. E I would a, b. I, I hate to say it's a shame. I feel well, slight shame, but whatever to say it now. But I didn't think that was a thing that a black girl would even be open to think about. To be open door could do whatever you want to say it. I don't even know. I, I didn't. It didn't even like. It didn't even enter my space of thinking like when I found out what a urologist was a specialist in the urinary tract and male reproductive like a woman and then a black woman at that like where no you know a surgeon I did not think I was a surgeon material if you would have asked me in medical school year one I would have said I probably am not going to make a good surgeon I was klutzy growing up and I just never saw any surgeons I didn't have any interaction with surgeons. I certainly didn't have any interaction with surgeons who were women or 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 and of color. Um, so it just wasn't in my thing, my in my uh, my viewpoint um, until I basically had this lecture. We had a lecture given by uh, the chair of urology, who at the at the time was an in, the interim chair was a black woman. Oh. Um, and yeah, oh wow, indeed. And so, you know, and in walks, in walks this young, you know, a statuesque, beautiful black woman who, you know, um, was the urologist and giving us this lecture. And I was blown away that the urologist here was this black woman that looked like me, that, that I saw myself in. And I immediately was like, oh, sis is a baddie. Sis is a baddie. <laughs> like just, again, like her taking up that space in yeah. a space that isn't you know you know for us or whatever i mean i would venture to say us taking space in medicine in any any realm is you know is a declaration is 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 um is a protest is a is a is something um is a so her doing that, it was a representation of so like so many now open doors that i didn't even think of existed um and so i wanted to basically shadow her and just get to know her, even if I didn't, I didn't know much about urology right at that moment, but I was like, I just want to get to know who this wonderful, right. you know, you know, boss of a surgeon, of a black woman, of a doctor, uh, who she was. And I learned to love, 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 fall. I fell in love with the specialty and what, what we did and how we treated patients. And I was immediately like, this is it. This is what I want to do. Oh, that's so neat. And see, that just shows how important representation is which is exactly why I'm doing these interviews, because I feel like if you only see Black people in, in the entertainment industry and you don't see them as lawyers, doctors, engineers, then like as a little kid, why would you think that you could be that? And so by doing these interviews, I'm hoping that I can reach individuals who are like, wow, that doctor looks just like me. Wow, that doctor comes from the same background as I do. I could definitely make it if they made it. And, and that's just awesome. That just shows that, that it works. Yeah, I told that is the reason representation matters. That is the reason why I even started my social media uh, presence is I wanted to show the world, 
you know, that a urologist is a normal black girl who is an immigrant and a little goofy and <laughs> likes to, you know, be ratchet on the weekends and, you know, is, you know, all these things that just you know, that, that I am and, and open the door for, again, the marginalized of us, you know, for other, particularly other little black girls, black women, um, black young people to see themselves in me in whatever way. And, uh, and if it's not urology, you know, maybe it's something else. Maybe it's right. biology, maybe it's not even medicine, but you see that, oh, wow, now there are like, I can, can I can take up whatever space that I put, put my mind to it. Um, exactly. mm -hmm. Like just creating options. Like that's what I'm all about. Um, medical school is really hard. I'm not sure that I would encourage a lot of people to do it, but I just want you to know that you have options. Like, I just want you to think yeah. that I can go do whatever it is I want to do. I just have to make a plan and then carry that plan out. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Great. And, I'm glad you, you mentioned social media. I am going to get to that because that is exactly how I connected with you, how I found you. Um, I saw uh, some of your videos. I thought they were funny. So <laughs> I was like, I've got to connect with her. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, before we get to that, I just wanted to talk about, you know, your route to medical school. Did you have any setbacks or any unexpected changes? How did that go? You know, I uh, fortunately had a very traditional route to medical school. Um, I think, um, you know, I had two um, very involved, educated parents who were financially able to put me in programs, do the review course, pay for these re expensive review course, re review courses, which are very expensive, um, and prop me up in a way to be able to do the standardized test well. I don't think that's a fair thing. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I do acknowledge that I, I had that privilege. That it was an economic privilege that I was, I've been afforded. Um, every standardized test that I've done, I took a review course for, like, you, right. know, like, you know, the review course, you know, right. just, you know, and so that helps. Um, and so I had a very traditional route straight from undergrad to medical school. I only had to apply once, take the MCAT once, and I got in and, um, it, you know, went through medical school. You know, the, you know, I think the, for me, the biggest um, setbacks were just personal, a lot of personal, like, doubt, uh, a lot of personal, um, just struggling to really believe in myself, um, mm -hmm. struggling with imposter syndrome badly and to yeah. this day to this day i still harbor imposter syndrome you know when i'm asked to speak at a speak at a conference or i'm speaking just in front of my colleagues you know at a regular department meeting i feel a lot of anxiety just thinking i'm my voice is probably going to sound stupid that you know yeah. like, like i don't know what i'm talking about um so for me it's always going to be that internal just you know uh, fight and, and struggle with this inferiority that the world unfortunately imprints on our brain. Right. Because for some reason, it's always a shock of like, wow, you did that. And then you kind of start to feel like if everyone is surprised, was I not supposed to be here? Yeah. And it's very hard to, you know, shake that and build that confidence to where you don't let a lot of things rattle you. Yeah. Especially again, because we're probably the tokens wherever we go or the onlys or the few or the, you know what I'm saying? So there's not a lot of people that, not a lot of places where we truly feel safe, you know? Right. And, um, you know, it's uh, in my field, it's a surgery specialty. There's the double edge. It's two, two sides. It's the gender and it's the, it's the race. And so, um, double minority, double inferiority complex, if you will, um, that plays in and we're kind of taught, I think as women, um, to maybe be not as assertive as our male colleagues because we don't want to come off a certain way, which is stupid. Our male colleagues don't even think about that. Right. <laughs> they just like assert right. themselves without thinking of anything, you know, but we're like constantly thinking, okay, do I assert myself this way? Do I do it that way? Do I, exactly. you know, I mean? double, double second guessing ourselves? So. 
And have you been able to find any sort of support or any sort of groups for women in medicine, women in surgery, Black women in medicine that have kind of helped you navigate this field so you didn't feel so alone? Absolutely. I would say more recently than actually during the, the trenches. So, you know, in medical school, I found my tribe, you know, there was a network, there was 10 of us black students in the entire um, class, and probably about, I think, eight of us, there was a married couple that kind of did their own thing. Um, and then I think it was like seven or eight of us that kind of, you know, you know, formed a network, you know, okay, uh, you know, and so and then be and, and, and then there were some non black people in, in this group, but I found my tribe. And so medical school, um, I had that support that, you know, uh, somebody to be like, come on, you know, you need to be studying, let's get a library, you know what I'm saying? Right. You need that, you know, when I'm not feeling like doing something that person is and vice versa, testing, quizzing, pimping each other, trying to, sh I, you know, sharpening each other's skills. Right. In residency, um, um, my, it was, you know, urology small. So it was just two a year in my program. And so you get, you are a very small family. And so you're either, yeah. I feel like you either feel like a family or you don't. Fortunately, I was in a residency that very much felt like a, like a family. There were certain certain times that I felt disjointed, but for the most part, I felt like a family. I certainly felt like I could go to my co-resident and we were like, you know, you yeah. know two, two, two peas in the pod. Um, and so um, I had that, but not a lot of, I'm trying to think during residency, I don't, I can't say I had a lot of black women surgeons that I could go to. It kind of got, I just got deep in the busyness of residency and I, and social media wasn't like it is now. Right. And organizations weren't like as easily connected as they are now. I think we've done a tremendous, you know, job of connecting people together that, um, um, that, that, we, that we need. And so currently now I've got like tremendous amount of easy accessible connections. I have a Facebook group where I go for women docs in urology. That's like my brain trust you know, and they're all women. And so we can, we go to each other for, you know, for, for professional advice as a woman and right. for, for like patient related um, science advice for all that stuff. I've got like definitely a sisterhood of black doc, black female doctors that are, you know, like sisters, you can't tell me we haven't known each other for like, since, since, since we were kids. Cause it, <laughs> exactly. You know, yeah. Because, um, you know, I have, I have so many different tribes um, now that make me a better person, make me a better physician, make me a better a mother, make me a better, you know, everything um, that pushed me. So, and, and allowing me these, also these avenues that allow me to mentor to people like you coming behind yeah. um, and really, again, I, I love, you know, you're, you're in a, such a great time because it's so easy to connect with mentors, to connect with people yes. on different levels. I didn't have things like this to easily connect and to, to get these, you know, to, to get these answers. Like you said, in the beginning, a lot of us don't have examples that we right. can, you know, um, to get that, that edge in. And so to be able to have people who can guide you is tremendous. Yeah, it's it's funny because I don't know if you ever watch Grey's Anatomy, but you know Debbie Allen is a urologist. I know. I found that out like last year. I posted yes. a video on TikTok, and somebody was like, "The real whatever the character's name is, I think it's Catherine Fox. I don't, I don't yes. know. Yes, is it Catherine Fox? Like the real Catherine Fox? Yeah, the real Catherine Fox. I was like, oh, oh, Catherine Fox, and then I looked it up. I was like, oh. Oh, they yes. made urology attending a black woman. Look at that. I mean, obviously yes. the show writer is a black woman. So, <laughs> but exactly. I love it. I was like, yay. <laughs> and that's what I love about Shonda Rhimes is she really yeah. makes sure to have representation mm -hmm. and, and, you know, fields of medicine where you don't necessarily see that. And then on TV as well mm -hmm. uh, and primetime TV at that. That's so true. it's huge. I'm sure yeah. there's people all over the, the the uh, all over the United States being like a black woman urologist that's far fetched. I mean, there's less than one percent of us. In right. The, you know what I'm saying? So like you know, but I love that Shonda Rhimes. Thank you. Yes. You know, I feel very um uh, seen. 
seen. That's the word. Yeah, <laughs> very seen. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, if the show's lasted 17 seasons, you can't tell me that representation isn't profitable. Yeah. Oh, it is. Exactly. <laughs> yep. Absolutely. Yep. Um, I don't watch okay. medical shows, so that's why I don't watch it. Not because it's not. Really? A do not watch medical shows yeah i don't watch i don't watch that like dra medical dramas i'll watch like okay. um dr pimple popper or my yeah favorite, you know like those reality shows yeah <laughs> yeah i i thought it was so funny because after my first year i like finally had time to watch crazy Anatomy, and i started watching it i was like oh my god i know what these words mean <laughs> yeah 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 you learn yeah <laughs> You don't have to know the words to like get the storyline. <laughs> I know. I've like unlocked a different part of my brain now. So mm -hmm. now I am like a superhuman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fantastic. 